Alan is watching on the BBC News Channel in the UK. He's saying, look, if the EU says we haven't left the European Union because we haven't triggered Article 50, how come they didn't invite us to today's meetings? Actually, a few of you have asked this. Today was not a formal summit. If this had been a formal summit gathered by the European Council, then David Cameron would have had to be here. That's what's happened on Tuesday. Today, what's called an informal summit, and when it's technically informal, then it is appropriate, given the circumstances and the UK's decision to leave, for these 27 countries to come together. Hope that explains it, Alan. Well, I've spent the last couple of days in the press pit of the European Council, thousands of journalists from all over the European Union covering this extraordinary story, and I'm delighted to say three of them are joining me now to discuss what we've seen. Let me introduce you to Maria Adresco from La Libra, Belgique. We've got Suzanne Lynch from the Irish Times, Brussels correspondent, and Tama, Tara Palmieri, who was with us the other day uh, on Outside Source. She's from Politico. Um, lots to digest. What would you pick out as the most significant thing you've seen? Well, for me, it was when David Cameron was asked if he was sad and if he regretted his decision to organize a referendum. And I remember he said, well, I am sad, but I don't forget, regret it. And I remember all of journalists looking at each other and saying, well, he, it must have been hard to say at that point. It was, you know, the end of his European experience. For me, I thought that the uh, president of the commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, was especially lucid on <clears throat> Tuesday in front of the parliament saying, I'm not a robot, I'm not a bureaucrat, a great bureaucrat, I'm allowed to have feelings about the UK referendum, I'm allowed to be sad. He was actually defending his right to hold the, the place as president of the European Commission, even though this is considered a huge failure to lose a member, the second largest economy in the uh, European Union. So he was there fighting for his life, fighting for his job, saying, I deserve this. And some of the things that came out of his mouth were almost rant-like, so I was a little shocked to see that, especially as an American, where our leaders are supposed to appear strong, not emotional, and he came off as emotional and, and uh, relaxed in a way that I'm not actually used to seeing. Um, for me, I think it's a, a bit more personal. I, I just am reminded, standing here on Friday morning, the feeling of coming in here uh, to the European Commission and meeting British people, British journalists, British officials who were literally in tears here. I met one man in his 30s who, who was crying and we went into the press conference inside here at, at 12 o'clock and there was, it was just a highly charged and highly emotional atmosphere. People were completely in shock and British officials here who were essentially going to be out of a job, I think the reality was really hitting home. Yeah, you know, but some people say that they will never be out of a job. I mean, I hear a lot of people saying, I bet that the Brexit will never happen. Uh, there is a lot of talk about this going on, so... Well, I think today, I, I think what happened today was quite interesting. We had Cameron here yesterday, and it was all very constructive and polite. But as soon as he was gone today, I think the tone changed. It was, as soon as Cameron has left the room, there's no more room for sentiment, no more room for emotion. Talk was tough uh, among the 27 remaining uh, members. I have to agree with you, though. I'm hearing from a word inside that they are actually questioning if Article 50, 50 will ever be triggered. And, you know, how long can they deal with the political, uh, political uncertainty until they have to just apply pressure themselves? I mean, we know that we have to wait until there's a new prime minister, mm. but at the same time, what does that do to the rest of Europe, to their stock markets, to their uh, political situations? Are, are they going to be less generous if... if uh, Britain puts them on hold for the next year. <laughs> yeah, I think what a lot of people were saying here as journalists, this summit today was so dramatic, but in one sense it was quite subdued. And I think the European Union are being quite strategic on this. They're saying, let's give them time. This is not the time for big ideas about the future of the European Union. Uh, let's not talk about treaty change. That's going to be something for September. They announced a meeting in Bratislava in September. Mm -hmm. So I think it's quite clever, really. It's like, let it all play out in London and then in the autumn and maybe looking forward to next March is the anniversary of the Treaty of Rome then we might see some big grand picture about Europe but they there's a feeling that now is not the time for that we just need to kind of calm down but you're also hearing in the sideline a little bickering between the Franco-German plan and mm. the V4 the Visegrad countries which are Poland Czech Republic Slovakia and Hungary who have their own ideas for what the EU should be like mm. and for them it's less Europe more internal market integration now this is really interesting because the Germans and I've spoken to several officials in the last few days are all saying the answer here is more integration push towards a federal Europe and then I speak to Polish representatives and they're saying that's a terrible plan you're just going to alienate people who aren't convinced about the European Union. Well the Prime Minister, uh, the Belgian Prime Minister Jean-Michel actually said that well 
we should stop be kidding ourselves, we should stop being hypocrite. 27 or, well, 28, 27 <laughs> countries of the European Union will never have uh, the same view of the European project. So, well, you know, Belgium is a member, is a founding father of the European Union, and it is in favor of this idea that those countries who really want to get more integration to go further within the European project so, should do so, and others will, you know, get the rest of so two track Europe. Europe he's saying basically well I mean I think what's interesting is that even Angela Merkel who's the, the real federalist Germany's real federalist was careful with her language I think she's realizing this is not the time to be start to talk about more Europe and what we're going to see over the next few months are, are every country taking a very different position you have some people on the softer end my country Ireland for example the Dutch and the Danish prime ministers they all echoed each other when they arrived at summit saying let's give Britain time and then you had on the other side France Belgium and Luxembourg saying no we need to get more clarity here from Britain. So the effort now in the next few months is going to try and present some semblance of unity while this thing plays out and then maybe have that debate later on in the but year. But you're also seeing the difference in opinion in the three institutions where you yeah. have Tusk, who is the con council president, saying, slow down, let's be sober, give mm -hmm. them some breathing room. And then you have the commission and the parliament saying, yeah. Parliament saying, if you don't do something, we're going to put a political initiative forward to, the, to pressure you. And not that that would do anything, but still. I mean, you would wonder about the judgment of the European Parliament. Martin Schulz on Friday or Saturday said, Britain must invoke Article 50 on Tuesday. And everyone knew that was not going to happen. So one would wonder about that reaction. I think it was very impulsive, very impetuous, also from the Commission here. And yet this week we saw a much more kind of calm attitude to, towards what's happened. And then they're also fighting about who's going to lead the discussion of the divorce. Is yeah. it the Commission? Yeah. Is it the Council? So you're going to see a lot of bickering around the capitals and in the institutions until we get some clarity. And also on that, I think it's interesting that Juncker, when he was speaking to the Parliament, like you mentioned earlier, he said that he had warned his 27 commissioners not to discuss anything with Britain, not to go bilaterally with any country. And that's quite interesting. He's trying to say, look, the discussion they're going to take place here in Brussels. We're all around the table, nobody doing any deals on their own. He actually put out a memo on Tuesday telling British officials from the director general level and higher, they're not even allowed to go to the UK. <laughs> um, all three of you, we could talk about this all evening. We probably will once we're off air. But thank you very much indeed. Thank we're going to leave it there. Appreciate Excellent. your time. Um, I spoke to one person.